Hey guys, uh, calling back with another update, and this is, uh, what is this, uh, January something, something, <laughs> I really have a hard time keeping track of dates and things like that, I don't even wear a watch usually, but I have lots of clocks and everything, and pocket watches that I don't look at, they're just there in my pocket, and it's taking, taking away like a time bomb. <laughs> anyway, I'm back to uh, show you some uh, some records uh, and some other some books, some old books and some other old stuff. Um, I'm gonna, probably going to start mixing this up. You know how I am. I just throw all kinds of stuff in my videos, not just music. And I hope you enjoy this uh, my new sort of uh, thing. It's not really new. I've always mixed things up, you know, every, every video is usually different with the uh, ramblings and whatnot. But let's get right to the to the records. I have a few here. And here we have um, Julie London. She was a very uh, nice looking lady and she has a very uh, nice voice. And this one is your number, please. I haven't even played this one yet, so I don't know how it sounds, but... Her other records sound uh, perfect, so I seen this, so I was like, gotta grab it for the cover, if nothing else. <laughs> and I, I'm pretty sure I already have this somewhere, but I don't know where it's at at the moment. It might be in storage. Uh, Patsy Cline's Greatest Hits. I'm really into these Greatest Hits records, because rather than collect a whole bunch of records with one or two good songs, why not just get the greatest hits ones where every song's a classic. And But she wasn't around very long, so most of her songs were classics anyway. Patsy Cline's greatest hits. And here we have James Brown and the James Brown Band. Ain't it funky? It's got some damage on the corner there, but the record's all right. There he is at his piano. I'm getting quite a few of these James Brown records now. And the last record is Freak Out USA. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mono record. Uh, I guess this must have came out around 67 or 68. When people were highly into like the LSD and uh, all the doping and stuff, <laughs> but uh, it's it's kind of a compilation. It's a compilation record. And if you want to pause it, those are the uh, bands and the music that are on it. And I'm gonna read this first uh, thing when it says here on the back. Freakouts. They're the wildest, most with it, things since Washington took Martha to the merriest minuet wig out this side of the Philadelphia. <laughs> and they're happening all over the place. Freakouts, that is, from Hollywood's phenomenal sunset strip to Gotham's most wing-a-ding night spots. Here's absolute mad madness at its most creative moment. Here's today's living is set, turning itself inside out with the sounds and sensitivities of 67. Swirling lights change from bleary blue to mellow yellow to a radiant hue of razzle dazzle red. Music of today's big beat variety states it's always moving case, but politely steps aside for the new rhythmless, melodious, melodyless, uninhibited, and totally out of sight sounds of the freak out. Ooh, it's just freaky. <laughs> Freak Out USA is the first song, and then Psychotic Reaction is the next one. I'm, I'm kind of picturing the, um, you know, the, uh, at the club or, or the bar or whatever back then, that they would, uh, there'd be a screen somewhere in the back of maybe a band playing, and there'd, there'd, there'd be all these weird, bubbles and stuff that they used to use for your psychotic freak out. I don't remember exactly how they did that. Was that the um, the old projectors that we used to have in school where your teacher would write on the uh, 
and a magic marker or something on plastic and it would project on a screen and back. Somehow they rigged it up to where they could use um, paint or colored bubbles or something and you'd see all that stuff in the back. Anyway, that's that. And next we have uh, an old Life magazine with John Kennedy on it when he was assassinated. Uh, November 29th, 1963. And these uh, Life magazines are fairly cheap to collect, like they're about five bucks each, unless it's a really amazing cover or something and they can go up sky high. But usually you can pick them up for like five dollars each and uh, you can get an old magazine rack like I have and put it in there when people come over they can look at some uh, some vintage magazines back then with the articles and there's like really cool illustrations inside of them. <laughs> This one's about vinyl flooring. The lady's all in her uh, 60s. That almost looks like Melania Trump's dress. <laughs> they not, and never mind. No, 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 I didn't say Trump. Uh, oh, look at this. Here's a uh, 1964 old. Look at that. Old uh, advertisement of a car. You could almost put some of these uh, advertisements in a frame. And uh, stick them around your place. <laughs> but uh, yeah, these Life magazines are really cool. You get a lot of cool uh, articles from way back then. And there's a guy carrying a huge bottle of booze. <laughs> Holy shite. They're going to really get south tonight with that. Or, they're going to get a, um, they're going to have a freak out <laughs> and, and a, a chemical psychotic reaction with that huge bottle. Holy cow. Anyways, then you can go uh, smoke your new ports. But I, I just find these old magazines really cool, especially life because they have such good photography and things in them. That's just one. I have several. Maybe I'll put one in now and then. We got the stuff on them. And let's see. Oh, I have. Some, I bought. I bought. I bought these three books for ten dollars each. And these are Tarzan of the Apes, Edgar Rice Burroughs. I'm pretty sure that these probably had a dust cover on them, um, but that got lost over time. But I was like ten bucks. Ten bucks a piece. That's not bad for uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan. And this one is copyright 1914, published June 1914. It's copyrighted in Britain, but I think these were made here. These ones, you know, there's the thing. And then I've also got um, Tarzan the Terrible. I guess he made a whole series of these. And Tarzan and the Ant-Man, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and that's got some pretty good reading in these. Just sit around late at night and read some some Tarzan stories. Some of them are Ill, got some illustrations in there. I guess that's supposed to be Tarzan, and there's some little tiny. I guess those are the ant people. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, Stuff like that. That just goes on my bookshelf over there with my collection of non-fiction type. I have a, I have my mystery section over there with the pulp fiction. And on this side I have like just old like Mark Twain. That sort of stuff. And next we have the pulp fiction. The pulp fiction I always like getting. And the first one is the young manhood. The young Manhood of Studs Lonigan. And look at him, boy, there. He's all proud. He's sitting around there with three or four. Oh, no, actually, he's by himself. The other two, there's two couples, and the lady's really having. Oh, holy. Is she pregnant? Well, no, they're all, they're all three with somebody, but old Studs Lonigan. He doesn't have a date. <laughs> Either that or he's up to something sneaky going on here. But the back of it says, 
The minutes, hours, and days went by in Studs Lonigan's life. There was always the question, what'll we do? And all the drinking, wenching, and fighting couldn't supply the answer, for Studs thought he was different from the rest of his gang. He was going to do different things and be more than they. Somehow, Studs never made it. No luck at all, no luck at all for that boy, that young, it kind of sounds like my life story. Dirty bastards. <laughs> anyway, those studs, here we got, uh, Room to Swing. Check out the blonde there, boy, she, I don't know if she's passed out or dead or what, but she's got a nice red dress on, and her shoes off, she's Cinderella. Um... You're a private eye, and this is your first really big job. A job that takes you from Harlem to the Deep South. That introduces you to some of the neatest babes around, and gives you the inside story of the publicity hocus pocus of a TV show. But before you even get warmed up to this sweet assignment, you're up to your ears in a frame. You're wanted for murder. <laughs> and there seems to be no place to hide. No way to stalk the killer because a guy like you stands out in the crowd because you're just a darn dirty bastard. Yeah. That's how it goes. Room to swing. We have five of these. Uh, we have the room clerk. There's an old man there and he's a fat guy and there's a gal and a guy in a striped shirt. And some people sitting around. Uh, who knows what the hell? Some what the hell they're doing? Uh, Prospect Avenue, hard rolled street of honky tonks and cheap joints was Harry Bower's domain. He ruled it by making money any way he could. Then he met a woman who exposed the viciousness of his tawdry world and gave him the courage to fight the evil forces which had made him a success. And I don't know which one's Harry or. Oh, who did it say now? Oh, I don't know which one's Harry. I'm assuming it's this big fat dude. And I don't maybe that's Harry. Not sure he's smoking a cigarette. And maybe this is the client. She's got a pink dress on and he's back there all fat looking at this guy smoking saying, man. Oh wait, maybe they're both no, he's just looking all fat. <laughs> And this one, Harry James, two world-famous short novels, The Turn of the Screw and Dave Z. Miller, some sort of um, horror type stuff. I don't more, normally buy, like, scary uh, story novels like this, but I just thought it looked interesting. Um, a terrifying tale of the supernatural which has mystified and enthralled readers for half a century. The last word in creeping horror, horror stories. And lastly, of this Pulp Fiction-y type stuff, The Top of the Heap. Oh, she's just really heaped on top in, it, in her, in her uh, evening gown. Um, somebody, they found her on top of some poker chips, maybe. And they're very colorful and bubbly. Uh, maybe they gave her a roofie or she's just passed out. I don't know what the hell's going on in that picture, but here we go. And, oh, this doesn't even say nothing on the back, I remember. <laughs> That's all it says. The defense rests. And there's a typewriter there. And lastly, you know, I, I, I have to throw in some antiques on this. I throw in some old stuff now and then. And I used to collect uh, salt and pepper shakers. But I gave that up like a few years ago and I got rid of all my salt and pepper shakers. And wouldn't you know it, I came across some that I really like. And these are from, these are World's Fair salt and pepper shakers. And these are from the uh, 1901 um, Pan American display uh, in the 1901 World's Fair in Buffalo, New York. And they're all engraved. Apparently they engrave your... Or somebody went and had these engraved. That's uh, George and May. Can't tell. It's either May or Mary. And here's George. And they went to the 1901 Pan American World's Fair in Buffalo, New York. And 
One thing about salt and pepper shakers, these are still useful. You can still use them for what they were intended for. You just got to clean them up. Clean up the old goo that might be inside. Uh, maybe there's a ghost in there or a genie. Who knows? This stuff's old. And nextly, we have some more. This one, these ones are the St. Louis World's Fair from 1904. And these are just two uh, metal type salt and pepper shakers from the St. Louis World Fair. And they're pretty neat. These are, I decided to do World's Fair stuff because you actually have a year on these of when they were made. Some of the oldie, uh, you go to the antique store, the flea market, and you see salt and pepper sitting around, but you don't know when they're from. They could have been made yesterday. Who knows? But these ones are pretty self-explanatory. They have a year on them where it's from. And all. Plus, you can still use them. Salt and pepper up your stuff. And that's all I have for y'all tonight. Until I see you again, I think this is going to be my sort of new thing. Records, books, and whatever antiques I'm going to throw in. I guess it's kind of been my thing all along. It might not always be records. It might be tapes. 8-tracks, CDs, an invisible MP3. Colin, over and out, and weirdos, unite.